Okay, uh, our next team uh, is uh, Pong Finder. Cust we, this one we have an industrial customer, uh, which is uh, ADI. And so, uh, this is team one. <coughs> Um, so good morning everybody. My name is Gregory De Gies. This is Robert. Uh, these are my teammates Robert Winnett, James E. John Michael, David Boshen, and Min Wei. And we are Team Pong, fi team pong Finder. <clears throat> now in a typical ping pong game, um, most people might find themselves uh, picking up a ping pong ball after every point in various areas of the room. And now uh, this might not seem difficult for most people, but for someone with limited mobility, this might be too difficult to do. Um, uh, something that might, be, that might be very useful in this situation would be a robot that could pick up all these ping pong balls. Um, this, for, uh, this could be used in, say, a recreational room or in an uh, establishment for disabled children. So our objective for this project was to build an autonomous robot capable of locating and retrieving a stationary ping pong ball in a 10 by 10 foot area. Now our requirements for this project is first to have an on and off switch to provide and cut off power from the battery. <clears throat> Second, to use an array of IR sensors that the robot will use to locate a stationary ping pong ball in the empty 10 by 10 foot area. Third, the robot must be able to pick up 75% or greater, uh, uh, must be able to pick up a ping pong ball with a success rate of 75% or greater. Fourth, the robot must, p must maintain possession 100% of these ping pong balls. And lastly, lastly, it must operate for at least 60 minutes. And our one constraint was to use the Blackfin Digital DSP. Uh, DSP. Now our deliverables for the project would be the completed robot, robotic platform, well-documented code um, loaded onto the Blackfin digital signal processor, and schematics for any custom hardware developed. So this is the, uh, the final product. Um, the biggest question from first semester was, how is the robot gonna pick up a ball? Are we gonna use a mechanical arm? Um, some sort of scoop maybe. We thought about having the robot kind of pick itself up and land on the ball and somehow entrap it. But um, there's a lot of mechanical difficulties uh, with all of those methods. So what we decided to go with was an air suction um, tube method. So how this works is that's actually a Delta Case computer fan um, in the back of the robot and the software turns on the fan and just inhales the ball. Um, you see the array of three IR sensors in the front, and that's how the ball is t detected by the robot. And there's two downward facing line sensors, and those are used to detect the black tape of the boundary, which you can see surrounding the robot. And um, on top is the Blackfin development board, and the breadboard in the back houses the uh, five volt regulator and some of the circuits, which we'll get into. Uh, this is the drivetrain that uh, I chose for the robot, um, and it is a differential uh, drivetrain. And uh, we, I considered many other options uh, using many different configurations, uh, different uh, types of wheels. And the reasons why I chose this one with uh, pretty much three wheels, we have one here, another one here, and the third um, castle ball here in the front, uh, was because it was easy to build, you know, especially given that we started from scratch with this uh, aluminum frame uh, that we have. Uh, they were easy to control. The two wheels in the back are the driven wheels and they are continuous rotation servo motors. And uh, the way that they have two power lines, they have the ground and power and uh, they have a control line which is controlled by PWM which uh, Ray will explain later. Uh, it was rather inexpensive. Uh, both of them came out to about 30 bucks. Uh, uh, this configuration is also more lightweight. If we try to use many more wheels uh, or any other types of configurations with more driven wheels, that would be adding weight to the system. And you know, we do have a power budget that we have to maintain as one of our requirements is to make sure that this is able to operate for uh, at least one hour. 
Uh, it is a holonomic system and it rarely needs maintenance. Um, and what holonomic means is pretty much that you can impart any motion vector with that type of configuration. So let's say you are at the point where the robot is when, well, whenever anything is happening. You can turn it in any angle, you know, 360 degrees, uh, 360 degrees, but you cannot really do that with certain um, other drivetrains, such as your car type. You know, you can't just decide to make your car turn 90 degrees, you know, from a stationary print. That will not happen. And the reason why I chose uh, to have that as a feature is because that would make it easier on the software team in terms of searching for the ball. If uh, it thinks that the ball is somewhere, you know, if it needs to, uh, if the software team needs to implement uh, really sharp turns in their algorithms, you know, when they encounter a wall or something, they would be able to do that and they would not need to maneuver around, you know, and go forward, backward, forward, backward until they um, actually turn. So here's a, a collage of the uh, major components on the robot. Um, up on the top left is the, uh, the line sensor for boundary detection. The, uh, this is the computer fan for a ball pickup. This is the uh, machine science robot chassis, which we mounted all of our custom hardware on. Here's the Blackfin development board provided by our customer analog devices. Here's the uh, infrared sensors, one of the sensors used to detect the ball. This is the 7.4 volt LiPo battery, which we use to power our system. And that's the, uh, one of the servo motors, which uh, runs at 5 volts. And we use that for, uh, to drive the robot. Uh, so those are the sensors that we use in the robot. And that is pretty much the schematic for all of them. These are uh, the line sensors that we use. And both of them, they operate. Uh, relatively the same way. It's pretty much a pair consisting of an uh, IR LED and a uh, phototransistor as you can see in this diagram here. And the IR LED transmits uh, the signal and if it is detected by the phototransistor, you know, that depends on the reflectivity of the surface where the uh, wave has to bounce back from or if there's a surface in the range at all even. Uh, if the uh, phototransistor turns on, then it brings the snow down to ground and uh, it sends the uh, input to the comparator and it outputs the correct thing. So if this node here is higher than that one, then the output is high and we have the indicator LED on there. Uh, which you can see on here, that is off. And you know, what that does for us, it enables us to you know, quickly troubleshoot and see whether the sensor is actually working or not. Uh, we also have the uh, sensors that we use in front of the robot. They operate pretty much the same way. The main difference being the range between those two sensors. Uh, this one, it has to be relatively close to the surface because of the way that the uh, IR LED and phototransistor pair is oriented. It is sort of at an angle. And why it is done that way is so that it can detect uh, things at a really, really close distance. So if you put the sensor too high on the robot, then it will detect that giant space between the robot, well, between the space where it's mounted and where there's actually an object as nothing being there and of course the um, LEDs will trigger so that gives it a really fine range where you need to put it really close to the ground or wherever object it needs to be detecting for it to work properly. This one, uh, the range is slightly bigger. It's from, it can detect anything within 2 to 10 centimeters and that is why we use it to detect the balls because if it if a ball comes within range of these sensors, the uh, pickup mechanism that we have, which is pretty much a fan which is attached to some tubing, is strong enough to uh, suck in the ball and keep it in the tube. So this is just a close-up of the pickup mechanism. Um, the ball would basically, um, anytime a ball falls within the 
is detected by the array of sensors. Um, it means that it's located in front of the robot in this area. So that will power the, uh, the computer fan. Right now we're using 7.4 volts right from the battery um, with the fuse to power it. And that will definitely, it, um, it meets our requirement of the 75%. Um, so this system works well as it is. Um, and basically, um, yep, the 75% uh, was the requirement. So that's what, why we, uh, we went with this method to, to meet that. Uh, this battery here is pretty much the power supply for uh, our robot. I have it, the picture here showing it charging. Actually, that's not the best picture to have while talking about this. Uh, I'll be going back to that slide. So uh, this is the battery right here. Uh, under the robot, uh, as you can see, this is the robot when it's in its operating configuration, and it's well placed under the chassis enough so that it doesn't drag or rub on the floor. And there's uh, a pretty good amount of clearance between the ground and uh, where the battery is. Um, it is attached uh, using Velcro under, and uh, I have this connection here. Uh, which pretty much splits uh, the power coming from the battery into three lines. I have uh, a line going to the 5 volt regulator so that it steps down the voltage and brings it to the servo motors which need um, 5 volts to operate. Uh, I also have uh, a fuse line directly from the battery that is connected to the fan. Uh, I also have another fuse line from the battery that is connected directly to uh, the black fin. So this is the, um, the functional schematic. Um, these four connectors here are part of the development board. Um, the development board has hundreds of pins and connections, so I only showed the ones that we use, uh, which is the timers connector, the PPI connector, the um, sport zero connector, and the sport one connector. Um, there's a lot of uh, internal circuitry, which provides, uh, as you can see here, I just put these power ports for uh, five volts and 3.3 volts at these pins. Um, here is these two and this are the uh, IR sensors. And right now, as you can see, they're powered, all three of them are powered directly from the board. Um, if any of you saw our first try at functional testing, um, we received, we got a lot of uh, noise because the sensors were powered externally um, over here. So we moved all sensors to the board and that got rid of a lot of the noise and some of the false positives we were experiencing. So. Um, Here's the two servo motors powered. This is a five volt regulator, so that powers the two servos. And um, as Jamesy mentioned, this is the uh, fast acting fuse. So if anything were to get shorted, um, basically this fuse will just break and we, you, know, you won't see sparks, it won't be dangerous. Um, so that's why the fuse is there. And um, over here is the DC brushless motor, which is the computer fan. And um, that again has another four ampere fuse. Um, to limit the current there. And this is the gate driver um, to bring the 3.3 volt signal up to the uh, 7 volts to uh, trigger this. Um, this is a power MOSFET here. So the black fin um, will trigger the MOSFET and that will turn on the fan when, uh, when a ball is detected. So that's the basics of the overall system. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the robot's layout and why we chose to mount things the way that uh, we did. Um, as you guys probably mentioned earlier, there are a few parts under the robot, um, such as the battery, which is uh, quite heavy. And the idea here was to attempt to make the center of gravity of the robot as low as possible to increase its mobility. Um, as some of you may know, you know, sports cars have a really low center of gravity and you know that 
accounts for a lot of their, you know, good handling abilities as opposed to, you know, a giant SUV, which is possibly more likely to tip. So, you know, you do not want to make the center of gravity relatively high because then, you know, this year is going to become Mr. Tippy and like if it just hits something at a uh, high point of contact, it may just tip over and, you know, you may not be able to recover from that. Uh, these ground sensors, well, line sensors are uh, mounted to the side because we wanted to space out the three hour sensors in front of the robot a bit more equally so that uh, they would be more likely to detect the ball. With the way that these sensors work, you know, they pretty much shine a beam of IR and it's a beam. With a beam, you don't really cover a wide range. So, you know, to be able to detect a ball, you know, you need a few more to um, perform that duty. Uh, the fan, we didn't really have much of a choice on where we needed to place it, so it had to uh, go on top of the chassis. Uh, we have the uh, red PVC foam boards on the side of the robot, which are pretty much acting as a uh, support for the um, Blackfin development board on top of the robot. Uh, and we also have a um, switch on the side of the robot, so you can turn it on and off and, you know, so it knows when it needs to start scanning the room for balls. All right, so the basics of the software are broken down. We have uh, within the interrupt there, are, like whenever there's an event triggered, it goes into an interrupt. And we have, and within that interrupt, we're polling to see whether it was the IR sensor or the line sensors to do different things. So the basics are the IR sensors will stop the robot, turn on the fan, which, uh, and then it disables the interrupts, so as the ball is sitting there, if one of the other sensors gets, if only one of the three sensors was tripped, then it won't log another interrupt for us. And then when the line sensors happen, it backs up, turns at a uh, like set angle, and then that also disables the interrupts, so it doesn't get a second trip. And then so the line sensor is re-enabled, and then in the main super loop, it turns the fan off after 15 seconds and re-enables the interrupt for the IR sensors. Uh, for the ball retrieval, as we said, we have the array of three sensors, which are evenly spread out through each to maximize our range of pickup. And then, so when any of those sensors are tripped, the ball, theoretically, the ball is sitting right in front of the robot. And so, as I said before, it stops, turns the fan on by sending the DSP reads the signal, then sets a GPIO pin to high, which was previously set to low. Sets it to high, which then enables the gate driver for allowing the 7.4 to go to the fan, and it and the fan and the pickup mechanism retrieves the ball. The super loop, as I mentioned, it allows the fan to run for about 15 seconds, which is more than enough time for the ball to be retrieved, and then it shuts the fan off by turn, returning the pin to a low state. For our system, we use virtual, we use black tape to simulate virtual walls, and we use line sensors to detect the virtual walls. When the robot is inside the search area, it will send a high signal to the black fin. The line sensors will send a high signal to the black fin. When it's near a wall, it'll send a low signal to the black fin. And that's how the robot knows if it's within the search area or if it's near a wall. And if it's near a wall, it'll back up and turn away from the wall. And the motors are controlled by a PWM signal. The, characters, the characteristics of the signal is here. It has a 20 millisecond low, has 20 milliseconds low and a variable high pulse. The length of the pulse determines the behavior of the motor. Our motors are calibrated at 1.5 milliseconds, centered at 1.5 milliseconds. That means that the motors will stop at if the high pulse is has a length of 1.5 milliseconds. Greater than that, it will turn counterclockwise, less than clockwise and the Blackfin DSP generates the PWM signal and that's how it controls the, uh, the wheels. All right, so this is just a little video of 
the robot movement, but it's actually not working within the PowerPoint, so I'm just going to pull it up for real quick. Uh, Does anyone have any questions then? This very basic version of it, our requirement was an empty room. So we we're just working towards that right now. Future work would be getting a camera to work on there. So it does image analysis where it would detect a circle. And then, so instead, and in that case, the IR sensors wouldn't actually be doing the work. Those would be detecting an object such as a baby's toy. And then those IR sensors would make the robot move away from that to avoid it instead of actually picking it up. Uh, how does the robot, robot searching the space kind of defined for it? Right, right now is just a very uh, like random algorithm that's set for when it sees the line, it backs up for it's approximately 0.3 seconds, then just turns. That was found to cover in our testing because of the limited space. We had a 6 by 4 foot square uh, rectangle. That covered most of it pretty well. Um, we had an idea for like scrubbing, like going up and down, but we weren't able to implement that in time. It was just really buggy and not able to function entirely. But that would also, I mean, ultimately it has a camera that would then instead just kind of like it move around and scan the room for a ball versus actually blindly searching. And to add on to what Rob uh, just mentioned, he mentioned that the robot would back up for about three seconds. Uh, the reason why is because the uh, servo motors, uh, they are rather reliable in their operation and they, that package that includes the servo motor has a, includes a feedback loop in there you know, to continuously update the position and you know, keep it rather stable. And as such, instead of using some type of rotary encoder to keep track of our position or how far we move, we do it uh, time-based. It's not the best, but it's reliable enough that we can do it that way, and it's been shown to work consistently. Okay, thank you.